What a rich blessing to worship with you this evening, to hear the stories, to see your smiling faces. Uh, I just read a study where they discovered that people actually think of you as more intelligent than you really are if you just smile. Did you know that? <laughs> so now you don't have to do this if you don't want to, but you're going to look dumb if you don't quickly. <laughs> just turn to the person next to you, smile really big and say, don't I look smart? All right, you don't have to convince them how smart you are. Uh, question, how would you like to work in a profession where it is your job to tell people how they ought to behave? All the while knowing you so often fail to live up to the very principles you preach. How would you like to have my job? where almost every week I stand in front of really nice people like you and I say things like, you should be kind and tender-hearted to your spouse, knowing I'm not always kind or tender-hearted toward my wife, she'll tell you that. Remember one time we were having this major fight, a disagreement, I got so angry, I took the cordless phone, I slammed it on the carpet, it bounced back up at the pinnacle of its ascent it rang. <laughs> so here we are, screaming at each other, well, if you had done that, and if you had done that, and thring, <laughs> Pastor Hafner speaking. <laughs> Inevitably, it's a church member wanting marriage counseling. Don't call your pastor when he's in the middle of a fight with his wife. It's just rude. <laughs> I confess, so often I feel woefully inadequate to do this right here because I know <laughs> the twisted motives, my dark side, the shadows in my own soul. I know I have no business telling people how they ought to behave because I fail so often. Ah, but tonight I stand here with a lot of confidence because I am going to teach you how to be a failure. And this is something I know a little bit about, isn't it, Sharon? Just this morning, I failed to show up to give the devotional to the pastors at the workers' meeting. I fail all the time, I'm really good at it. So I'm going to teach you how to be a spiritual failure, okay? Now the principles flow out of an Old Testament story. It's really more like a love story. It begins with Jehoram approaching his father who is the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat. Dad, he says, I am in love. Who are you in love with, son? Have you seen Athaliah? She is exquisite in her beauty. No, son, no. You cannot be in love with her. Well, why not, Dad? Well, you know why not. Because Athaliah is King Ahab's daughter. And if you were to marry her, then that would form an alliance between Judah and Israel. And you know that's not God's will. The story obviously takes place after God's people had divided into two nations. You had Judah and Israel. Day after day, Jehoram pesters his father, but dad, I got to get married to her. I love her. And finally he gives his consent. It's not long after that he receives an invitation from King Ahab up in Israel. Come, let us celebrate this newly formed alliance between our kingdoms. Alliance, Jehoshaphat says, I knew that it would come to this. But he goes anyway. Point number one. If you want to be a failure, go where you don't belong. 
I don't know what your struggle is. If it's drinking, then just go to a party where you know they'll be serving alcohol. If it's certain websites, then just refuse to put certain safeguards on your computer to keep you from going to those websites. Just go where you don't belong. It's just a matter of time. And so Jehoshaphat gets his entourage together. They go up to Israel. They see the threshing floor there before them. Now, normally, the threshing floor was used at the time of harvest. They would take, for example, something like wheat and put it there, and then horses would gallop over it. Then, when the wind was just right, they would take these huge trays and scoop it up, throwing it into the wind. It would carry away the shaft, leaving the kernels. But on this particular evening, there are no horses, there is no harvest. Instead, as far as the eye can see, tables and tables, mountains of food, food that has already been offered to Baal and other foreign idols. Exquisite carpets for dancing. On the other side of the tables of food, you have six thrones. On this side, two thrones, one for King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. On the far other side, two more thrones, one for Jehoshaphat and his queen, but in the center, a throne for Jehoram and Athaliah, the couple to be celebrated on this beautiful evening. There's dancing and gorging and feasting and laughing and partying everywhere. As the evening wears on, Ahab corners Jehoshaphat. You have a wonderful son. We are so glad that we're connected now through our children. He's a good man. Point number two, you want to be a failure, listen to the devil's flatteries and just entertain the thought of compromise. You don't have to do it, just think about, well, what if? And listen to the devil's flatteries. I can handle it this time. I won't get too flirtatious with her. I'll just go to say hello. I can handle it. Just listen to the devil's flatteries and entertain the thought of compromise. Because really, the whole battlefield in spiritual life is the mind. Right? That's where temptation always begins. Just think about it. Dwell on it for a while. So Jehoshaphat listens. He likes what he hears. Until Ahab gets to the real agenda for the whole party. By the way, he says, Jehoshaphat, do you remember the territory up in Ramath Gilead? Well, yes. The Syrians took that from you, is that correct? Yes, well, what about it? I want it back, it's mine. Okay, but see, I don't have the military strength in order to reclaim the territory that's rightfully mine. But I was thinking, if we could combine our armies, then I would have the strength to get my property back. What do you say? Jehoshaphat squirms. He knows this is not God's will. Trying to buy a little time, he says, well, do you have a prophet? of whom we could ask whether or not this is God's will. Well, he was ready for that objection. Ahab says, I not only have a prophet, I have 400 prophets. He calls the chief prophet forward, Zedekiah. Please, seek the counsel of God, whether or not it is his will that we should combine our armies and reclaim the territory that belongs to me. So Zedekiah calls all of these prophets together. They huddle there in the middle of the threshing floor. I can imagine in the huddle there is a conversation something like this. So some rookie prophet says, what are we going to say to the king? Zedekiah barks, we're going to say exactly what he told us to say. Now make it look like we're praying to God. Scripture tells us that Zedekiah and his prophets not only could prophesy in the name of Yahweh, but in the name of Baal as well. How convenient. Finally, it's this serious melodrama described in the Bible where Zedekiah gets this large ox head. 
He puts it on his head, protruding from it long iron horns. He then approaches the thrones. He starts dancing around, shouting and yelling. Go, he says, and be victorious. God says he will bless you. He will give you your land back. Go and claim victory on this day. Ahab excitedly glances over to Jehoshaphat. Well, I guess 400 prophets of God can't be wrong. Are you ready to go? Jehoshaphat knows this is not God's will. Squirming in his seat, he says, well, do you have any other prophets you could ask? <laughs> now it's Ahab who's squirming because he knows. Well, he admits, yeah, th there is one more. But the Bible says that Ahab says, but I really don't like the guy. <laughs> well, why not? Well, he's always prophesying against me. That's the one I want to talk to. <sighs> All right. He calls a servant to go fetch Micaiah, a prophet of the living God. So the servant goes. He raps on the door of the prophet. Micaiah answers, and the servant explains, the king would see you, sir. And this is what you are supposed to say to him. Micaiah stands tall in the Bible. He says, I will say to the king whatever God tells me to say. Oh, how this world is hungry for people who will not be bought or sold. For men and women who are unafraid, who will speak truth to power, who will obey wherever God leads. Micaiah is one such prophet. He goes to the threshing floor. He sees before him Jehoshaphat. He is sick to his stomach. He knows all of this is a big charade. He sees the food that they have been feasting on, knowing it's already been offered to Baal. He sees the drinking and the dancing going on. And finally, he approaches King Ahab, who asks him, is it God's will? that we should combine our armies, and like a cat toying with a mouse just before the kill, he sarcastically answers, yeah, sure, go ahead, send me a postcard from Ramoth Gilead. Let me know how that all works out for you. Sure, go ahead, and God says he will give you victory. Ahab is incensed. It's like a scene out of a blockbuster Hollywood movie, an old movie, where Ahab points his bony finger in the nose of Micaiah and says, don't mess with me. You tell me the truth. And Micaiah says, the truth? You can't handle the truth. Here's the truth. As sure as there is a living God in heaven, I tell you this day, you will not return alive. That's the truth. So we pick up the story now. In 2 Chronicles 18, verse 23, at that point, Zedekiah went up and slapped Micaiah in the face. Which way did the Spirit of the Lord go when he went from me to speak to you, he asked. Ahab is angry too. He demands that they take Micaiah, throw him in solitary confinement, and verse 26, Ahab says, give him nothing but bread and water until I return safely. And I can just picture Ahab looking at Micaiah and saying, mark my words, prophet, I will return safely. And they haul off Micaiah. It's the last we hear of him in Scripture. After all of this, Ahab looks to Jehoshaphat and says, so what do you think? <laughs> and if you can believe it, Jehoshaphat says, I'll have my army ready to go into battle with you tomorrow morning.
point number three. You want to be a failure? Go against the clearly revealed will of God. Jehoshaphat knew this was not God's will. And yet, he went anyway. For the last 17 years, I've had the privilege of pastoring on a college campus. Through the years, I've seen a steady stream of young people parade through my office, often asking the same question, how do I know God's will in my life? And I will often talk about different things. One of the points I always try to make is the question I like better than how do I know God's will is how do I know God? and to focus on building that intimate friendship with Jesus. And then I will also often make the point that in my own spiritual journey, I've discovered that it's the stuff I clearly understand in Scripture that I struggle with the most. Most of it's not fuzzy or gray. When Jesus says things like, hey, if you have anything against your brother, before you come and worship, go and take care of that man. It's those things where I understand God's will. It's just difficult to follow. (laughs) Jehoshaphat, he understood God's will, but he defiantly chose to disobey. Next morning, when Jehoshaphat shows up, he has he is quite surprised to see Ahab. He wonders, what's up with with your threads? Oh, yeah, I had this idea as I was going to bed last night. I was thinking, if I dressed like a peasant, then when the Syrians see us, they wouldn't recognize me. They will see you in the royal chariot, your regal gowns. You look beautiful, by the way, Jehoshaphat. They will come after you. We can surprise them and outflank them from the south, catch them off guard, and destroy them. Good battle plan, don't you think? Very well. See, what Jehoshaphat didn't realize, all of the Syrian soldiers had been given a direct order from the king. He was very specific. The king of Syria had ordered his chariot commanders, do not fight with anyone, small or great, except the king of Israel, King Ahab. So the Syrian soldiers were poised, ready, given strict instructions, if the Israelites attack us, ignore everybody on the battlefield, just go after the royal chariot so they don't even get into a squirmish. The battle hasn't even started as Jehoshaphat comes rolling over the hill to take on all of these Syrian soldiers before anything happens. Just like that, he is surrounded by hundreds and thousands of Syrian soldiers, all of them arrows pointed right at his head. He has a 360-degree view of all of these arrows pointed right at him. It's like those old Southwest airline commercials, need to get away. (laughs) Jehoshaphat looks to God and says, Oh, my God, help me. I went where I had no business going. And I listened to Ahab, and I listened to the devil's flatteries, and God, I just disobeyed your clearly revealed will. Unless you rescue me, I have no hope. God, help me. When he prayed that prayer, it confounded the Syrian soldiers. They wondered, hold on, time out. That can't be Ahab. We just heard him praying to God in heaven, Yahweh, the God of his people. Who who is that man? So scripture says, In verse 33, at that moment, someone drew his bow at random and hit the king of Israel between the sections 
of his armor. So some soldier randomly fires an arrow. It sails high in the air, and wouldn't you know it, it lodges itself between the section of Ahab's armor. Ahab is sitting over here in the shadows, and that arrow finds his heart. They prop him up so that he has a front row seat to watch the battle in front of him that day. And it is a massacre. The Syrians slaughtered God's people, wiped them out. One of the worst defeats in the history of Scripture. It was an awful day for the Israelites. And at sunset that evening, King Ahab died just as the prophet Micaiah had foretold. Wow. <laughs> what a story, huh? You have to wonder, so did Jehoshaphat learn his lesson? Or, more relevant to us tonight, what do we learn from this story? Well, if you flip ahead just a couple of chapters, you get this picture of Jehoshaphat. Now, back in Judah, he's down in Jerusalem. When the alarming word comes, verse 1, the Moabites and the Ammonites with some of the Meuites came to make war on Jehoshaphat. Some men came and said, Jehoshaphat, this vast army is coming against you. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek the Lord. This time, rather than saying, yeah, let's come up with some willy-nilly battle plan and let's go out there and fight, he calls a timeout to say, we are not going to even do anything until we fast and we pray and we come together as a community and together we practice the spiritual disciplines that will put us into the presence of God so that we can understand and then we will resolve to follow whatever God's will is. That's what we're going to do. But it all begins with time with God, fasting, praying, seeking His face. Finally, they receive a word from the Lord through the prophet Jehaziel, who says in verse 15, this message, listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. And then this great verse in the Old Testament, one of my favorites in the whole Bible, Jehaziel says, don't be afraid, don't be intimidated by this vast army that is approaching to fight you. For the battle is not yours, but God's. One of the most important spiritual principles I know. The battle is not yours. The battle belongs to the Lord. You let God fight those battles. That is God's work, the work of transformation, the work of overcoming temptation. The battle is not yours. The battle belongs to God. So they had the most interesting battle plan this time. They go to the battlefield practicing the spiritual disciplines of corporate worship. Together they sing, give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. They are fasting, they are praying, they are worshiping together, and when they get to the bluff overlooking the valley below where they are prepared to do battle, Lo and behold, God has already been there. He has turned the enemy onto itself. 
And scripture tells us that the plunder was so great with equipment and gold and valuable things, clothes and so on, that it took his people three days to collect all of the plunder and even then they couldn't get it all. An amazing victory because they didn't even fight the battle. They simply trusted when God said, I will fight the battle for you. The battle is not yours. The battle belongs to the Lord. See, spiritual life is not about trying real hard to overcome temptation and to win the battle. Spiritual life is about investing ourselves in building intimacy with Jesus engaging in the spiritual disciplines that catapult us into the presence of God so that through his Holy Spirit, he then lives through us and fights our battles for us. See, the battle is not to keep trying, but to continue trusting that he will fight the battle for me. What I will do is enter into a life of training through the spiritual disciplines. Now, we understand this principle in most every other arena of life. Take, for example, the physical arena. By way of hands, I'm curious, how many of you could bench press 200 pounds right now? There are a few. I always get little kids who throw up their hands. <laughs> Uh, but most of you aren't <laughs> doing that. Uh, now, if you were to enter into a life of training, the day could well come when you could bench press 200 pounds. How many of you could bench press 200 pounds tonight if you just tried really, really hard? See, it's not a question of trying harder. This is why the Apostle Paul says, I go into strict training so that I can win the race. We go into this training. Now, you look at professional bodybuilders. Their whole life is built on training so that they can do by training what they could never just do by trying a little harder, right? On our honeymoon, the morning after we got married, I had the remote control. There were lots of ch uh, channels to choose from in this hotel suite. And I stopped on a program I had never seen before, never even heard of it, but there's this program called Divorce Court. <laughs> so Cherie, my wife, starts watching this, and then finally she says, well, this is inappropriate. Give me that remote control. And because we were such newlyweds, uh, I did not understand that the remote control is the domain of the husband, not the wife. So I gave it to her. The Bible is very clear on this point. Amen? That's a very base sounding amen there. Uh, so Sheree has the remote control. And of all of these programs to choose from, she starts watching this live bodybuilding contest from the shores of Miami, Florida. Now, you know what these guys look like, right? They're rippling biceps and triceps and fingernail seps. I mean, they have muscles on their breath. So Sheree stops and starts watching this program. She's looking at these guys, flexing and so on, and then she looks at me. Did I say something funny? <laughs> Very offended by your laughter. She looks back at the TV. Finally, she looks at me and she says, you know, I just don't find myself to be attracted to well-built men. Not real sure what she meant by that. <laughs> and I'm way too insecure to ask. <laughs> well, those well-built men that you see on TV, this is what Kent Maris, a professional bodybuilder, says about these guys. 
So it's those guys in the magazine that have that look, that look is what they do for a living. The maintenance of that look is what they base their entire lives upon. It's a lifestyle. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We are such a now society. Guys come in thinking in three months that they can become ripped and hard, and that's very unrealistic. If you are serious about looking ripped and hard, you must enter into a life of training. That means you must arrange your life around those activities that will enable you to do by training what you cannot now do by trying. You talk to any mature follower of Christ who has this rich legacy of just being a sold-out disciple of Jesus. You ask that person to share their story, and inevitably they will talk about a life of living in the presence of God through Bible study, through prayer, through fasting, through all of these spiritual disciplines. A life of training. Now, for many years, I preached this very message. It's not trying, and I still believe that, but it's about training, and I still think training's important, but I've come to the conclusion more recently in my own spiritual journey that that's not complete, that it's not just about training either. Ultimately, it's about trusting that when God calls us righteous in Christ, we can trust him. When God says, I will make you a new creation, we can trust him. The battle is not in trying harder. The battle is to keep trusting that he will fight for us. In the words of Thomas Kelly, don't grit your teeth and clench your fists and say, I will, I will. Relax, take hands off. Submit yourself to God. Learn to live in the passive voice. I love that. It's my prayer almost every morning. God, today, just today, help me to live in the passive voice and to live moment by moment perfectly surrendered trusting you to fight the battle for me. So often we approach spiritual life like it's this difficult assignment, as if we're being asked to keep a hundred beach balls submerged out in the Pacific Ocean at the same time. Now, if you're a really strong swimmer, you might be able to keep this one and that one and another one under the water and use your feet to keep a couple of more, but inevitably, it is a recipe for feeling defeated and exhausted every time. They just keep popping up. And so a lot of times, our approach to spiritual life becomes this very difficult task because I know all of the faults and uh, sins inside me. And so I think if I can just work on external image management, if I can keep pride and gluttony and lust and all of these things at least under the surface so that you don't see them, then at least you will think of me as holy. It is a recipe for feeling defeated and exhausted every time. When spirituality is just about image management and behaviorism, it's just so discouraging. We know this, don't we? We can never quite be good enough. So what's the answer? Get out of the water and get into the boat with Jesus. Live in the presence of Jesus and trust him to fight your battles for you. When my youngest daughter was going through that potty training stage, we set up a reward system with her that involved Skittles. One Skittle for one thing and two for another, which is more information than <laughs> you, you really need. Uh, suffice it to say, on one afternoon, she did not see me standing over in the corner of the kitchen. 
And Clara had just grown tall enough, and she figured out that if she stood on a chair on her tippy toes and reached high into the pantry, she could just reach the bowl of Skittles. Now, she knew she didn't deserve any Skittles. And I could tell the great controversy was raging in this little kid's heart because she wanted to do what was right, she knew what was right, but the flesh was craving a sugar hit. So the spirit was willing to be good, but the flesh just couldn't allow that. And so finally, she drags this chair across the kitchen floor, gets up into the pantry, gets on her tippy toes, just gets a fistful of candies when from the distance, I cleared my throat. <clears throat> Poof, Skittles <laughs> everywhere. Then the little munchkin had the nerve to approach me with palms open. What, Daddy, what? I don't see anything wrong with that. Now, this is an amazing thing to me. How is it that one moment she cannot resist temptation, the next second she's not tempted at all? She's a perfect little saint. What? I didn't do anything. What made the difference? It was the presence of her father. Now I know parables never stand on all fours and I'm not suggesting that we follow the father out of fear of punishment or whatever, but I love that picture. Living in the presence of the father because this is all God wants is to be in a personal, intimate relationship with you. That's it. And this is how we grow. This is how we become victorious in all of our battles. We trust him. Pastor Maury Venden used to talk about how when he was in eighth grade, he desperately wanted to grow to be six feet tall. He was the shortest kid in the classroom, and that included all of the girls. So this was not a good thing. He decided that he was going to make himself grow. He went out to the clothesline and started hanging there. Of course, before he got out there, he measured himself carefully so that he could chart his progress. When he got exhausted from hanging there, he raced back into the house and measured his height again. Guess what? He didn't grow at all. Of course not. But we understand. You don't grow by trying hard to grow, right? You grow by eating. If he had spent the rest of his life hanging on a clothesline so that he never had time to come inside and eat, I think it would be safe to say he never would have reached six feet, only six feet under. It's just spiritual death trying a little harder to grow. No, 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 no. We grow by eating. And this is the invitation of our friend Jesus Christ tonight to every one of us. Revelation 3.20, this from the KHV, which is the Carl Hafner version. Knock, knock. Who's there? Jesus. Jesus who? Jesus Christ. And what do you want, Jesus? I just want to come in. If you just open the door and let me come in, I'll eat with you, hang out with you. Nothing heavy, no forced agenda. I just want to be with you. That's all. Knock, knock. Knock, knock. I'm still knocking, Jesus says. I'll leave you with an email somebody sent me a while back. Young lady who I don't remember meeting, I don't think I ever did. She writes, Dear Mr. Hafner, 
I heard you speak at an early teen meeting at the Florida camp meeting back in May of 1995. So that's a long time ago. 1995. Uh, so immediately I was impressed with this young lady that she has that kind of a memory. Uh, I have a photographic memory, but I can't get the lens cap off. <laughs> So I like that she can remember whatever I said back in 1995. She says, I still remember your message. You talked about Zacchaeus, and your conclusion was that people change by being in the presence of Jesus. That was a profound truth that has shaped my spiritual life ever since. I tend to drift toward legalism trying to muster enough spiritual muscle to be good. But I always get brought back to the gracious truth that my only job is to stay in God's presence and trust Him, and He will change me.